So yeah, I got an old iPad I wasn't using. I set up all these controls to be able to get different camera angles and stuff, but I got too excited. I didn't test it properly and the audio wasn't coming through, um, but now it is. So we got a lot of stuff to cover today. Um, I had quite a bit of, <laughs> it's so dark. Let's crank it up. Check this out, guys. Let's crank up the lighting. Pacific Northwest says it's dark. Okay, that's about as bright as we can get it. I was going for like kind of a, a special mute mood here going, you know. <laughs> but we had a lot of people vote in the voting this week. Um, quite a few people, almost 400 people voting on if you guys are flying alone, if you're flying with other people. Um, and I was really surprised at the results of the poll. I was really, really surprised at just how dark it was. Not how dark it was. I was surprised at how many of you guys are flying all by yourself that don't meet up and fly with anyone else. Um, it's a really a much, much bigger number than I would have thought. Almost 60% of you guys are flying by yourself. Um, and that's really just way too many. And I'm going to kind of tell you guys why. I want to get your opinions of why it is that you're flying by yourself. Why aren't you meeting up with the crew? Now, I do get everybody is busy. And so it's not like um, you have to be like the Houston crew. You know, the Houston crew gets together. They may be the most frequently flying city in the country. Louisiana is probably up there as well. Um, we fly easily. Uh, there's some guys in towns that fly 10, 12 to 15 times a month. I mean, they fly that often. We're about to have a quadruple header uh, event starting on Friday. We're actually going to have uh, some of the big names down. Heads Up is going to be down in town to fly with us. Chief is going to be down. Um, Quaboose from Louisiana and some of those Louisiana folks are driving over from next door. Uh, so we're going to have quite a big turnout, four days of racing in a row. And you don't have to meet up with everyone that much. Even just coming out and flying with somebody, even if it's just once a month or even once every couple of months, just enough of that interaction to be with people that are current in the hobby because not everybody has enough time to just immerse themselves fully and learn every little in and out. So being with people that know what's going on in the hobby can be quite a bit of support. You can get some of that conversation out. Uh, it's funny, anytime that somebody comes and flies with us for the first time, they just want to sit and chat because, and you can see the look on their face, they're just smiling, right? Because uh, there's other people that are actually interested in talking about their hobby. Their wife, their kids, their parents are just so sick of hearing about drones. And finally, there's like all this group of guys that are all ready to talk about exactly um, what you want to do. Uh, Jeff says, I can't drive. That doesn't help. Yeah, you know, we did have some younger pilots back in the day. Uh, Wolf. Uh, who is now actually one of the Catalyst Machine Works builders, or he was for a while, uh, when he first started with us, was just a teenager. And uh, he's got to be in college now, I guess. Uh, so, yeah, it, it, sometimes it is hard when you got to get your sister or your mom or your dad to drive you to the events um, or to the fun flies or to the meetups. So that kind of brings us around to why is it that you guys are not flying with more people? And is it just because you think that you don't need to? And the reason why I say that is because that would still be me. I would still be flying all by myself. I wouldn't be flying with anyone else if I hadn't accidentally come up upon a couple of guys that had set up some gates and were racing a few miles from my house. I just happened to be flying um, across the parking lot and I saw some people flying drones. I'd never seen that before. And they were flying through gates. I'd never seen that before either. And so I went over there and chatted them up a little bit and asked if I could try it. And I had already been flying probably over a year. 
like I had already gone through a bunch of bind and flies. I'd already built a couple of quads. I was already on my first like nice build. I had an Armatan Chameleon and I figured, let me just try it. You know, like I don't really care about racing. Let me try it. And man, I was hooked and it was nice. You know, as, as, as good as a pilot, as you think you are after a year of flying, um, it, that illusion vanishes so fast when you see somebody rip a five inch quad at a 40 degree angle and are just going like two times faster than you've ever dared to go and the sound that it makes when you hear that first full throttle rip and the, like your 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 head can barely move fast enough I mean, it's just so crazy. Like, yes, you've had that punch going straight up in the air, but you couldn't imagine that first time you see somebody actually doing it in a straight line and navigating through trees. It was just an amazing feeling. And so to get better, not just to have that support system, but to actually get better, having those people around you is really, really huge, guys. Um Let's check up on the comments real quick. Um, races meets fly less than 10 packs and all day, and that's it. Nitro nuts, that is a really good point. And the first couple years I was doing races, I noticed that too. And that was kind of the old way of doing it. And so we have changed the way that we race in our town. Um, so an official event where you have ranked and then all that stuff yes you do can sometimes only get 10 packs five practice and five actual that count uh, so we kind of abandoned that we started doing more of a fun fly race style where we would still have the timing system up and you just keep going you know it's like you're you rotate and when it's your turn, you go and you go and you go and you go and you go. So on a good day, flying all day, there's several people that have generators in town now. You can keep flying. You'll easily be able to get 30 to 40. Sometimes I hear some people that stay all day are getting 50 packs in a day. Um, so we started doing it that way. Yes, we keep track with the timing system so that we can see like who had the best three laps consecutive, who had the fastest lap for bragging rights and whatnot. But we found that we were all getting a lot better, a lot faster if we were able to get a lot more stick time, a lot more packs. And so if, you know, you may want to check with your local racing chapter. Yes, back in 2017, we were doing the 10 pack thing, but we kind of quickly realized without actually counting and ranking each other, we could get a whole lot more packs. Um, so there you go. Uh, let's see. Lone Star is here. Pacific says, if you haven't seen PDEVX, please check out his channel. Arguably the best freestyle pilot around. Yeah. So let's kind of go over some of those poll results real quick. I'm going to pull up the poll results uh, so that you guys can check them out too. And uh, I was in, I was surprised by this one. Like a lot of times I kind of have a good idea where the poll results are going to be, but I really did not think um, this one was going to play out quite this way. Um, so the poll results say that we had 28% of the people say that they do get together to fly with people for freestyle. 10% say they do fly with people for racing. 3% says that they have flown with people, but not in the last year. Understandable. 46% say, no, they've never flown with anyone, but they want to. 46% guys. And 14% say, no, and I never care about flying with anyone because I'm going to crank my BTX all the way up to one watt of power. Um, so that's four, over 400 people, 408 people responded to this poll and 60% of you guys are flying on your lonesome. And that's, you know, that's a little bit disappointing guys. 
Um, so I'm thinking it's really going to have to be an effort made. I would really encourage everyone to get out and fly with people at least once or twice. And if it's not for you, you don't have to keep going back, but just get the experience, the exposure, because I was like you. I didn't think I cared to fly with anyone else. This is a hobby that I enjoyed like many of my other hobbies. The fact that I could do it on my own. I could research the info on my own. I could learn how to build a quad on my own. I could build it up, learn how to go fly, fly whenever I wanted. I didn't need anyone else's help. I could do it all on my own schedule. And I love that part about it. But boy... Once you do start flying with a group of folks, if you've seen my race vlogs and you've seen everyone having a good time at the night spot, I'm just trying to share what it's like to actually be there in person. And it's just such a bad, an incredible experience. But what's more than that, what's more than that is that you instantly get a community of support, a community of people that you know and that you can potentially meet up with if you're having issues, troubleshooting issues. You instantly multiply your access to equipment, to knowledge, to everything by a factor of 10. If you think it's nice to be able to look up virtually any topic um, that Barbell has covered and he does that so well, He's such a great resource for the community. Imagine having multiple resources like that that you can talk to one-on-one -on -one in person and have them help you. Imagine how much quicker you'll be up in the air because they can help you diagnose those issues. They may just have that bit of hardware that you're missing to get your flight build done. They might have an extra set of props when you run out. They might have an extra set of batteries when you run out. And so it's all about keeping those supplies in hand, keeping everything that you need at your fingertips. It's not just about having the socialization of it. And yes, I do like you know, to socialize and whatnot, but I don't have unlimited packs. So if your concern with going to fly with people is, well, I want to fly as many packs as possible. And if I'm with a bunch of people that are all chattering, or if I'm waiting for my turn, I'm not going to fly as many packs. Well, that might be true. And that's why if that's your primary concern, you probably don't want to go fly with a group of people every time, but you at least want to get it in the rotation. And if you're with a good group of people that are up to the line and ready, um, you can really churn out those packs quickly. You see, sometimes I think that when I'm at an event or I'm at a race, some people might be thinking of me like, Okay, you're not really chatting that much. And I do, you know, have a good time, but I'm there to fly. I don't have unlimited days and nights to go fly myself. So when I'm there, I'm really focused on flying. Whenever my, I pick up my quad, the second I sit down, I change out my battery, strap a new one on, it is ready to go. Now I can chat with everyone else so that when it's my turn, I'm instantly ready to go. People make the mistake of not being ready when it's their turn. That slows everyone down. So when you do go out there, be sure that you are focused on getting the maximum amount of packs and don't slow everyone else out down around you. Um, but yeah, let's check up on some of these comments real quick. Uh, Small says that my last draw was I drove an hour and a half to Waller, spent an hour and a half setting up the track, Crashed out in the first five minutes. Ah, make sure you give up that $10 before you leave. Oof, oof. Yeah, okay, that is that is a fair point. Um, if you are going to be racing, um, probably have a backup quad. And if you have a backup 5-inch, go ahead and bring your 3-inch and your 4-inch with you too, just in case everything crashes out. Uh, so racing is, it can be, um, a little bit destructive, but never forget there always is that rookie route available. If you're, if you're new, you don't have to go through every gate, just fly over the track along the same path as the track. Um, we always have that rookie route available 
don't feel like you have to go on some of those more precarious maneuvers and smash up all of your quads. Nobody's going to think anything less of you unless it's an actual ranked event, which those are fairly rare. Uh, if it's just a fun fly style race, just go ahead and come out. But do be prepared that uh, you may have to drive. You may break something. And if you only have one quad, uh, yeah, you, you know, that is a fair point. You may want to have two quads. But if you got two, bring them. And even if uh, sometimes we do see some people that come and they really don't want to fly because I think they are scared of breaking their stuff. And we do encourage them, just fly over the track. Don't go home with a broken part of a uh, pile of parts. Don't fly um, past the point of your comfort level. You know, if you're not comfortable doing that split S, the dive gate, just skip it. So good point. Um, Jeff said he's been meeting people online, but hasn't, um, hooked up with them yet. Yeah. You know, go ahead and get out there, man. It's, uh, it's all about that. Jason says, uh, it's about timing. I don't always have the same schedule and I get out and fly when I can. That doesn't make it easy to meet up with people. That's a good point too. And that's why it made it so difficult with the old racing style was you had to basically be there from the beginning to the end with the fun fly style that we do now. You can kind of jump in for two, three, four hours and then take off. And so even if people are going to be there eight hours and you can only go three, like it still works out. So I think more people or more chapters should do that style, you know, at least a portion of the time to be able to get more people going. And I think that's why Houston has actually seen a period of growth, especially this past year with everybody home. People are looking for hobbies. We've seen a lot of new uh, racers come out, try their hand, really get addicted. Um, a lot of, and then there's also some folks that only come two or three times a year and we always welcome them too. Like you don't have to be competitive. We want to see you come out whenever your schedule allows. Like, yeah, you don't have to make it to every event. I don't make it to every event. The folks in town, like I said, race 12 to 15 times a month. You know how many times I race a month? Maybe three, sometimes two. I just don't have a schedule that allows me. Yes, I do go fly by myself when I'm reviewing all the stuff. I'll, I can always run out at lunch and get some packs in. Uh, sometimes after dinner, if time permits, but, uh, you know, I don't have that unlimited schedule either. So I try to, when I do get out and fly, be able to have the majority of the day so I can get as many packs as possible. And that's kind of the secret guys, you know, whenever you the, Whenever you're with that chapter, that community, that crew, if you're part of the freestyle folks, I was surprised to see that almost three times as many people that fly together were freestylers. I, I thought it would be a lot closer to even numbers between. In fact, I even kind of thought there would be more racers. Uh, but the freestyle folks are getting together. Now, how do you find these people? If you Let's just say you're starting to learn how to fly. You know you're not an expert yet, but you're considering, should I start meeting people? Yes, you should. Don't wait till you think you're a good pilot. Go now because learning from people, seeing people in person, you know, I'm telling you there's no substitute for actually witnessing it. Yes, you can watch a million Mr. Steel videos, but seeing someone doing it, hearing their explanation, having them spectate you and give you tips after you land and being able to try them literally in seconds is going to make you so much better of a pilot, so much faster. It's unbelievable. Um, Alabama says, I'm in Phoenix City, Alabama on the Chattahoochee across from Columbus, Georgia. We have whitewater rafting. There's a website. <laughs> uh, I mean, I don't know if I would go flying a quad over people that were whitewater rafting, but I mean, I'd like to see that. That would be cool. Um, David Spivey says, the birds are my only friends. <laughs> Do the birds actually like your quads that much? I don't know. I feel like sometimes they don't like mine so much. Uh, <laughs> in Alabama, that is a cinnamon dream. Yeah, that does sound like pretty cool. You better want to have some, um, some carbon, uh, some conformal coating on that if you're going to follow people that are, that are whitewater rafting. Yeah. 
Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Eric Toft says, flying at a racing event, no matter how bad you are, is fun. That's right. You know, my first several races that I actually attended, it was probably 2017 or so. It was so much fun. And you know what? I got last place almost every time. Now, the first race I attended, I was racing my Armitan Chameleon. Um, I met those guys. I, I found out when the next event was. I went. There was like 12 or 15 people racing, and I tried my hand. Now, back then, the point system was a little bit different. Back then, you would have five tries, and it was the total count of the number of laps you completed over the whole day. So if you could keep flying without crashing, um, you could technically get a much higher score. And so like I wasn't fast enough to really be crashing that much. And I had you know been flying for a while. So I was able to complete all five of my heats. I ended up getting sixth place. My first race, that was amazing. And I thought I was hot shit. I was like, yes. I was uh, clearly a drone master. And you know what? I got last place every race after that for like the next four or five times I went. Uh, so, yeah, don't get too over overconfident. Every time you think that you're actually going to be good, you're still going to be crappy. But that's why you just got to keep trying and stick time is the king, guys. Just keep getting that stick time. Let's catch up to some more of these chats. Um, I see says, I thought it was an odd bowl. I don't fly with others. I fly to get away from others. You know, I can totally relate. And I think that a lot of us in FPV have that same kind of mentality, that same kind of outlook that we just want to get away from it all. But when you're with the crew, you still are kind of away from it all. And so, uh, yeah, I would still encourage you just once or twice to get out there. You just might like it. And if you don't, you don't got to keep back going back. There's no subscription that someone's going to make you sign up for. It ain't the gym where we're going to guilt you if you don't show up, guys. Uh, it's totally fine. Uh, <laughs> Gibson says he agrees that it, uh, I, I know you were out there, Gibson, getting some race laps in. Uh, Gibson's our local autocross expert. Uh, that comes out to the race, uh, the drone races every once in a while. He finally made it out to the night spot, I think, this past week. And I saw the aftermath pictures. So it looked like he had a good time, but maybe had some fixing to do afterwards. Um, Carbon says, I got our first complaint from the FAA today. Got to call the man about a little cage flying in our front yard. Whoa, is that really? Uh, what do they can do to a five-year-old? Whoa. That's uh, that's a little crazy. Is that for real? Um, <sighs> Eric says they're always going to invent new ways to break. Yeah, you'll always find ways to break stuff. You'd be surprised if I look around this room how many broken parts I got piled up everywhere. But, you know, that's the fun of it. You know, break, crash. Come home, fix, and then repeat. That's how you got to keep doing it, guys. Um, Jeff says you met people on live streams in the Facebook groups. Yeah, man, you're about due. So get out there and we can come up with us. Small said he's chased somebody down some rafting. Hit me up. Yeah, yeah, y'all should get together. Smalls does some pretty cool chasing stuff. DT says go out, find cool spots, and you'll find others. It may take a year. I've met three people in the past four months, only one freestyle ball, and we've been meeting up a lot. Yeah, you know, sometimes you just happen across people, especially if you're flying at cool spots. But you know what can accelerate the process is getting on Facebook. Search the name of your town plus FPV or your town plus drone. So I'm in Houston. If I just went and searched Houston FPV or Houston drone, I'm going to find a couple of Facebook groups. And from there, you can find the freestylers. You can find the camera drone folks. You can find the racers. And you can decide which type of uh, meetup you want to go to. And just get together, do some ripping, learn some tricks. And if you still prefer to fly by yourself, uh, go right ahead. But now, guess what? You have a contact. 
you have a buddy that you can sell your stuff to if you need to or that you may be able to buy his stuff if he's got to sell. And so, you know, the circle of flight, that's how it all connects. So get in the community. Don't just sit on the sidelines. Um, Pacific says, have you tried the Express LRS for racing yet? Anybody in your crew fly it? Uh, there's a few people that are looking at it. I'm not going to try it uh, personally just yet. I'm going to wait, let others do it. Um, I do test an awful lot of stuff, but one thing I don't like testing or fussing with or dealing with is issues with control link. You know, after flying a lot of the Fly Sky when I first started and Fry Sky later on and dealing with their braking compatibility issues, you know, ever since I've been on Crossfire and you never have to touch another bind button again, setting up a quad is so easy every time. I just I just can't give that part of of it up. Maybe I'll try it um, at some point if it seems to be proven, but I'm not going to be an early adopter on that front. It does look promising though. They do look very small and it potentially could be a bit less expensive. So it's all good stuff. I'm waiting to see and then I'll dive in a little bit later after it looks safe. Small said, I won the first rookie race with a two-inch whoop. I remember that. I was there for that day. Uh, yeah, he was racing with, against five-inch people with a little uh, HD, like, whoop thing. And, uh, yeah, I mean, if you got the skills, come on, give them a try. Um, Jeff says, I got a tab pool that came with the Nano RX, and I'm waiting for that Crossfire TX. Oh, yeah, once you get that sweet... Sweet crossfire. It's hard to go back. I do hear a lot of good things about Tracer, but I haven't tried that one yet either. You know, the reason why is because I'm really lazy about things like taking a module out of the back of my radio and swapping it to another one. It's just not something I want to do, guys. Oh, oh. And so if they could come up with a module that had both Tracer and Crossfire in there, that would be pretty dope. I would get that, but I don't know if they're going to. Um, DT says he's from Houston. DT, we're having a huge bunch of events this week, and so definitely come out and join us if you can. We're going to be at the night spot that you've seen on the race vlogs on Friday night. We're going to be at uh, the countryside Palacious uh, Race location out in west houston or no north houston on saturday and then they're going to be doing a tree track on sunday and then a nice spot again on monday four days of racing i'm going to be there friday and saturday so if you want to come hang out with me um heads up and chief and some of the other folks are going to be there on some of those other days so we're going to have some big names coming down i'm going to have my gear out there get some content for you guys so stay tuned if you want to see uh, how our guys do against some of the best in the world. That's going to be really exciting. Um, Small says, still waiting on that one-wheel review. Yeah, I don't know if I'm going to get it after all. Uh, there was a guy locally selling his one-wheel, and I thought about picking it up. And then I remembered, like, I still have, like, this scar from my nephew's uh, hoverboard, and I was only going, like, two miles an hour. And I got some pretty gnarly road rash. So I don't know if I really want to get something that can go like 18 miles an hour. Uh, yeah. Uh, Carbon, keep us updated on that FAA thing. Uh, that sounds crazy. Pacific says that I'm pretty sure the TBS Mambo will be able to run both 2.4 and 900. Ooh, yeah. You know, it's funny, though, because if they hadn't already called the Tango radio the Tango, that product would probably be called the Tango because it's got two protocols, and it takes two to Tango, but, you know, the Mambo just doesn't really – have the same ring of it though, but I, I probably will review that product only because I've been really wanting to do uh, a video with the song of 
Mambo number five. And so like that'll be perfect uh, if they do come up with that. I'm going to have to hit up Trappy and see if I can get a copy of that so I can do a Mambo number five video. Uh, Jeff says, you don't remember those dip switches? Oh, yeah, dip switches, man. That was actually a little before my time, but we have had some people show up with old gear, uh, VTXs that worked on dip switches, and there was only a few guys that still remembered how they worked. So that's the other reason, though, why it's good to fly with people. Um, so <clears throat> Gibson says, maybe the Mambo will be five and one. That would be nice if it could do multi-protocol plus – Crossfire plus Tracer. Oh, I would buy that. You know, I'd, I'd buy that in a second. It would be nice to be able to put Tracer on my racers and use Crossfire for like everything else. Uh, I just, I'm so invested in the Crossfire system. I think I have probably over 30 Crossfire receivers. So it's, it's hard to be able to make that switch. Uh, NG says, come on, just the Mambo number five references are priceless. Yeah, God, like I can already see how it would make the video. I'd be like a quick set of cuts to like one, two, three, four, five, and I could have like three crossfire receivers, and then like two tracer receivers, and then that would like kick off the video. But then I'd have to cut it like soon after so I don't get demonetized for stealing the song. Although that reference might be good enough. Like sometimes if the song is good enough, I'll just take the demonetization hit. Like on the race vlogs, um, when I had everybody walking up on the track walk, the first race vlog that I did, and I had to use the song from Reservoir Dogs, Little Green Bag, where everyone's walking real slow. Like I knew that was going to get demonetized, but I was like, I, the song's just so too good. Like I got to use it. And so I might have to take the hit for Mambo number no. five. Um, any word on the release of Tadpole HD? Yes, uh, they were gone to manufacturing, I believe, two to two and a half weeks ago, and the estimate was three to four weeks. So I'm thinking in the next seven to 14 days, they should be hitting the shelves. So stay tuned for those Tadpole HDs. They are coming soon, um, very, very soon. DT says, you ever think about diving the Transco Tower? I don't really do the building dives. I'm just a little scared for that, but there have been – I do know of some people that have done that before. Uh, it does look quite thrilling, but, uh, yeah, uh, I think the night spot is, is close to an urban um, environment that I'm going to find. Now, if I could find an abandoned tall building, I'd be all about it. Or, you know, I mean, I guess to be fair – if the guys are out building diving, they're doing it at a time when nobody's there, right? You go to a building on the weekend, there's nobody working. If it's not, you know, if the business is only open during the week. So, yeah, you know, maybe one day I'll try it, but I haven't done that yet. No, but it would be cool. <laughs> Carlos says, do the Mambo number five video. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, I've been waiting for somebody to make a product either called Mambo. And Diatone, um, actually, I got one of the little thingies right here. Diatone's line of, of flight controllers is uh, called Mamba, which is close enough. So I've been waiting for them to make a Mamba number five. Right now, they're on version 3.5. So it's getting closer. But it's like, okay, three was out. And I'm like, all right, now we only got to wait for four. And then we'll be on five. But then they did 3.5. I'm like, oh, my gosh, come on. Diatone, you're killing me there. Uh, <laughs> Binti, <laughs> Mambo, Johnny Five. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I got to do it. I might have to like take some dancing lessons for that one too. <sighs> Angie says it needs beach babes. Um, Quad Doc is here. What's going on, Quad Doc? Um, does the OSD RSSI supposedly match the radio? RSSI says 49%. I don't know. I don't ever use RSSI. I just kind of like test approximately where the limits of my radio link are, and I just don't fly farther than that. 
Uh, I've rarely ever had a fail safe. I just don't long range though. Like if you long range, you absolutely need it, but I don't long range. So I've never bothered to do the extra steps to set up RSSI, especially once I was on crossbar. I'm like, eh, it's just like the more things you put on your OSD, the more often you're going to be looking at them. So I really only keep a couple things on my OSD flight time. Um, just because I'm, I don't want to get too carried away and average cell voltage. Now, the reason I do average cell voltage instead of total battery voltage is because if you're doing three and a half um, volts per cell and you have the total voltage, you got to do that mental math. Okay, what's that times two cells because I'm flying a whoop? What's that times six cells? Whereas if you just put the average, you only look for one number of 3.5. Um, so that's what I do. And that's all I put on my OSD. If I'm on analog, I do actually put the throttle level just because I like to be able to review how punchy a motor is and uh, being able to see the throttle on there. That element doesn't come through to DJI OSD yet, though. So you can't really do it there. Um, <laughs> Jason says, that sounds like another poll question. What song... Do you hear in your head when you fly, or what song would you use for a video of your flight? Yeah, um, <laughs> I, I typically scour um, the net for copyright-free music to use for my videos because I do want to be able to keep the like the two dollars that I might make if I do make a popular video. Uh, so I do think hard, and like I, I find it really works a lot better if I pick a song ahead of time. I go out and fly to that song. And that's the song that I use for editing. I'm lucky that I have a couple of buddies who uh, produce music. Uh, Rick and my buddy uh, Steven, who his uh, albums or his art artist name is Aorta Project. If you've seen a lot of my recent videos, I've been using a lot of songs from both of them, especially uh, Aorta Project. Lately, he's been killing it. He really is uh, a really talented artist. He's got a couple of EPs that are coming out very soon. So... Um, I'm fortunate to be able to get permission to use some of his tracks for the videos. Uh, but yeah, I mean, definitely fly to music, though, is another tip, especially if you're by yourself. Even when I'm out at the races, I'll usually have like one earbud in my ear. You know what I mean? I'll have like my one earbud in like this. And uh, because it's just so much more nice to be able to get that flow when you're hearing a nice song. And so I'll just put on Pandora or pull up a specific song and fly to the music. And you know what? If it's a nice flowy track, sometimes I'll put like a, a little haul of notes on, you know, like whenever I'm going down that, that split us and it's just like, I can't go for that. Can't go for that. Oh man, it goes down hard. So you got to pick the right type of music for the right type of flying. If it's nice and easy, you don't want to have some kind of hardcore techno, but if it's a real back and forth punchy track, then yeah, it's got to be like some kind of EDM. Uh, let's catch up on some of these comments. Uh, <coughs> probably not a coincidence that the Mamba boards are black. Yeah, and they use this gold kind of uh, accents on there too. Jeff says, turning off analog uh, RSSI and beta light. Uh, let's see. Beep tube says I just spent an hour and a half helping a local new guy get his tiny hawk bound. We succeeded and I finished some repairs on my six inch shark bite build. Nice. Yeah. It's always nice when people come out, we're able to get them flying and it's all, it's always a group effort. A lot of times we'll be at a race and people will come out and sometimes they'll only come out because they want us to help troubleshoot, get them bound. And, and we're happy to do it. Um, what we usually try to do is like tag team it, right? So we had a couple of guys come out. Um, you know, I had a young guy come out. He needed to, some help to get his stuff bound up. And so we had one guy that was like troubleshooting, trying to diagnose the issue. They figured out that the receiver just wasn't working properly. Um, so I was like, I live the closest. So I said, I'll tell you what, I'll drive. I'll go get him a receiver. He can have it 
because I'm not even flying FR Sky anymore. You can have an XM Plus that I have sitting around if you'll install it for them. So we did like a three-way tag team of troubleshooting. That way, none of us really had to give up too much of our racing, and we were able to get them up in the air. So good on you, BeepTube. It's always nice when you can help somebody else experience that miracle of flight, pay it forward, help everyone else. Um, Nitro Nut says, what song? The Top Gun song. That's what he... Now, when you're listening to the Top Gun song, are you listening to the main theme or are you listening to the Danger Zone? That's what I really want to know. Or, or are you listening to Take My Breath Away? <laughs> uh, that's awesome. I've done the same on Messenger. Quad Doc says, I hear there's a cool freestyle day organized by Pinjara this Saturday. Uh, if you don't know that. Yeah, there's also another uh, Facebook group. A guy, Kai, I think it was, emailed me today. Um, they have a Texas meetup group, and I forgot what part of Texas they're in. If you're in the comments, Kai, uh, leave it in there where people can go to find you guys. So it doesn't matter where you're at. There's probably people flying that you don't even know about, so go find them. Okay, we're going to spend the last few minutes talking about talking about the new DJI. Let's get a picture of this sucker right here. Let's get a picture of this sucker right here. Let's talk about let's talk about the DJI thing that is coming out, guys. The DJI thing that's coming out. This crazy DJI unit right here. This is going to be the air unit made by Cadix. Can you see that, guys? You see here on the left we have the original air unit and on the right we have the new version now as you can see the air unit case seems to be identical um as barwell and blunty noted in their stream earlier today the mmc connectors are pushed out just a little bit to give you a little bit better connection as you remember on the original air unit sometimes that connector would come a little bit loose because you could see how recessive it is so they fixed that issue now the camera it does look like the lens is the same lens and it does look like it has a metal case like the um, original DJI camera. Now, this is 19 millimeters, meaning that it's a micro. So is it the DJI camera in a micro size, or is it a Nebula Pro with a new metal case? That's what we really want to know. What are your hopes on what that should be? Um, oh, did I even share that? Did I even share that? Can you, could you even see that? Okay, yeah, yeah, you can see it. Yeah, so, yeah, Ethan, this is live. Ethan, I can see you right there in the comments. It is live. Uh, so go ahead and ask it. Michael Matthews like stuff like bump from rehab. Nice. Smalls just passed his part 107. Congratulations, man. That's awesome. Going to start a new channel. Need to hook up with your music, guys. Yeah, for sure, man. Uh, I'll pass you some of their info and see if they're still going down. NG says, thanks for the Ender 2 or Ender 3 V2 recommendation. Made everything from whoop canopies to raptor claws and printing some fender flips for my mini crawler. Best investment in RC period. Yeah, thanks, man. I really love my printers. Uh, I still have three of them sitting around this room and one that I haven't built yet. Um, they're just so much fun to be able to just have an idea in your head, draw it up, print it out. Um, I'll tell you what. This was like the second thing that I designed in Fusion 360. And uh, it's a vertical laptop stand. So... Um, you know, let's just say, you know, my laptop's much bigger than this, but it fits in there like this. So I basically use my laptop as a desktop most of the time. I was able to take my some measurements. My laptop has sort of an angle at the bottom, so I included that angle right here. And being able to print this, uh, I've been using it for over a year. It works great. I use it every single day. And it was a, a fun project to draw up. It was a good exercise to help me learn some about Fusion 360. 
and I've been designing more and more parts ever since. I've designed several FPV parts. I'm still kind of a novice, but it's fun to be able to have things around your house that you've printed, that you designed, um, or even if you just found the file and printed it and you get utility and use out of it. Yeah, definitely super fun. Um, Michael says he has songs programmed into his radio. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to have to put it in an episode. My buddy sent me a file, uh, a video of a couple years ago. He was fixing another one of our friend's radios. And while he was doing it, he reprogrammed all the sounds. And so my buddy Jorge, <laughs> so Yvonne from this channel, you might have seen him. He took Jorge's radio and programmed Despacito whenever he turned it on. <laughs> It was pretty funny, and he and Jorge was not amused at all. He did not think it was funny, but it was extremely funny. Uh, let's see. Pink Floyd, Learning to Fly is what he listens to. Yeah, yeah, I hear you, I hear you. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Eric says, I hope it's the original camera. Um, <laughs> Ethan says, okay, thanks. <laughs> Omar is here. What's going on, man? Uh, Jeff says he listens to Symphony for Cruising, Metal for Freestyle. Symphony for Cruising, that's an interesting idea. Uh, like some classical symphony or like modern symphony. Are you like, uh, <laughs> do you like Mozart <laughs> or are you more of a Beethoven man? Zip Zap Bang says, is that why it's taking so long to get a Cadex camera? I ordered mine May 19th, and hopefully they'll send it soon. Yes, the chip shortage is real, guys. And Kebab has been saying that we can expect about a 30% increase in parts across the board very soon because of the chip shortage. Uh, once those raw materials are out of uh, stock and they are going to have to manufacture more, Everything is going to be a little bit costlier for everyone to get from the top down to the bottom. So we all may be in for a little bit of a, a cost increase. So will that impact your flying if that is the case? If you do see prices uh, skyrocket, are you still going to be down? Um, if you all of a sudden get an analog quad for... You know, so let's say an analog quad is about two hundred dollars. You know, thirty percent increase would mean it'd be two sixty. A DJI quad, let's say it's four hundred dollars. That would mean that it would increase to over five hundred dollars. How many quads are you going to keep going if the price across the board um, goes up thirty percent? You know, what's interesting though is that the bind and flies may not have the full increase in cost because they're able to manage costs by having economies of scale, meaning that because of how much they can do, and a lot of the bind and fly manufacturers, especially iFlight and Diatome, are making everything on their quads top to bottom. That's why they're able to get those so cheap. That's why you can get a Roma or a Nazgul for 180 bucks on a good day. Um, which is like way cheaper than you could build the equivalent quad. So will that cause a shift in, in people moving to more and more bind and flies? Unfortunately, for the type of flying I do, at least for my racing part of the hobby, it's really not an option. You got to be able to build your own. So like that's not going to change. But a lot of the other stuff I fly for the channel is bind and flies. So. <clears throat> but yes, yeah, ZipZag, that's why it's taking so long. The chip shortage. Um the FPV y'all authority says no one wants to fly all y'all alone. <laughs> I see what you did there. I see what you did there. That's that's freaking awesome. Okay, Carbon Cage says, uh, I just seen your comment. Would be cool to head down. Okay, yeah, y'all, y'all, y'all meet up, guys. Y'all meet up. Michael says he has the Halo theme as the opening sequence when he turns on the radio. That would be cool. Like, uh, or, or or is it like the Master Chief theme where it's like, yeah, 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 I get what you're saying. 
<laughs> Carl says, I love Mozart. I love Mozart. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you like Beethoven. Can you, Oscar says, can you please explain the MG, the MHW, GHW stuff, please? Wait, what is that? What is MHW, GHW? I don't know what that is. Okay, Small says his latest video has a full piano performance of Nothing Else Matters from Metallica. So go check that out, guys. On his channel, Princess FPV Drone says that the first time getting you live. Oh, Princess, man, thanks for coming by, brother. Nitro Nut says that FPV is still cheaper than drink. That's true. As long as you don't drink some cheap ass stuff like Natty Light, <laughs> then yeah, FPV is probably cheaper, especially if you drink good stuff. Uh, so. Uh, Carbon K says, uh, it's only drama for us with no transport here at the moment. You don't happen to have two spare seats, do you? Yeah. Uh, Lee says, where can I get a Hornet 2? The Hornet? Uh, is, are you talking about the iFlight Hornet, like the green Hornet Cinewhoop thing? I'll, I'll see if I can put a link in the description for you. I'm sure I'll find one. I need to check out Smalls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Evan says, where do you buy the cheapest HD VTX? I don't have any replacement for my drone if it goes out and I'm scared. Well, it's not about the shop. You don't shop the shop. You shop the sale. And the best way to shop the sale is in the FPB Sales Alerts group on Facebook. Uh, we scour the net for all of the best sales in FPV, and we get them to you in real time so that you can save the most. Uh, in the past week, we have had a couple of good sales on Nebula Pros. Um, we There's currently a small stash of V1 air units that you'll be able to get for a lower price than the V2. The V2 air unit that we showed just a few minutes ago is going to increase in price up to $189. $189 for a DJI air unit. That is probably going to push a lot of us to the Nebula Pro. Now, the Nebula Pro was $149.99 at introduction, but due to the chip shortage and due to another number of variety of other factors, the price on that has jumped up to $165. So in pre increases in prices uh, across the board. So stay tuned to that FPV sales alerts group. Um, we'll try to find you something in there. All right, catch you later, Jason. Uh, Lee says, Hornet, bro, one of the two. Uh, the Hornet, like, so I made I, I made a three-inch Hornet, which is a frame um, by Quaboost, the Torque FPV Hornet. It is a three-inch DJI. But iFly also makes a Cinewhoop called the Hornet. So are you talking about the iFly one? I'm guessing probably. Carmen says, gone are the days when you can ride in the back of a Utes quad dock of a Utes. What's a, what's a Utes? What's a Utes? Like the two Utes? <laughs> if you can make it, no dramas, would love to fly with you guys one day. Yeah, you guys definitely need to go fly together. L. Leston says, are the batteries somehow affected by the chip shortage? I can't find tattoo V4s anywhere. Well, Leston, feast your eyes on this. Do you see this bad boy? Ooh, I just took it out of the box. I'm going to sleep with it under my pillow tonight. That's right, guys. Tattoo V4. Oh, I got sent one for review, so I'm going to save this for this weekend's racing, and I'm going to fly it on the best pack of the day. Uh, this is the best battery on the market right now, but it's also the hardest to obtain. The Tattoo V4 1400 milliamp hour 6S pack, it's is essentially like strapping on, lacing up a pair of PF flyers. Uh, it, <laughs> it will make any kid 
go faster and jump higher. And it is the only thing that will help you to pickle the beast. So, yeah. Mike Bergman, where have you been? Oh, man. Yeah, we're just about wrapping it up, brother. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, this pack is extraordinary. I tried a friend of mine's. I have a few of the V3s, which are also really, really good. They're the best batteries I have at the moment. But... A lot of the guys that went to the Mayhem race, the big team race that happened where all the top racers were there, several of my guys were there, and they said that these Tattoo V4s were the real deal. They performed much better. And while the V3s were also very, very juicy, the V4s had a special ability, is what they described it as, a special ability that they would bounce back much quicker and seem to damage uh, less frequently when discharged very hard and very low. So that's exactly what I'm looking for, a battery that can allow me to go full throttle through as much of the track as possible. I can't wait to try this sucker out. Just a couple of more days for the weekend. Uh, so I do – I'm glad you said that because – um, uh, one of the problems with reviewing things is sometimes you get too excited and you go fly something before you have a chance to get some footage. So I'm going to put this in the booth and get some video footage before I risk crashing it to bits. Uh, because look at that, the shrink wrap is still all perfect. Uh, yes, my very own tattoo before. Mm. A Ute is a car, but it's like a pickup. <laughs> okay, that's what I thought you meant. Uh, where where do they call a car a Ute? Is that a is that a like Australia? Where is that? Uh, Mike said he just ruined two of those batteries by leaving them charged for a month. No, you ruined. How did first of all? How did you even get two tattoo V4s? They're so hard to get. It's almost like getting two PlayStations or having two television sets back in 1955. <laughs> Oh, Marty, it's just impossible to do. <laughs> Is the Roma L3 a good drone to fly in a small backyard? Oscar. The Roma L3? You mean like this? This? Yes, it is a great one. Now, I will say this. If you were going to fly it in your backyard, these motors are like probably one of the most powerful motors I've ever flown on this size craft. These 1206 uh, 4S motors, like look how notchy they are. Like the power is incredible. I like them so much. When I built that Torque FPV Hornet HD 3-inch, I use these same motors because they're just like – I've never felt anything like this. So on 4S, it's almost too much power. So if you're going to go in a backyard, I would go ahead and fly it on 3S or put like a really good throttle cut. But these motors are just so juicy. You have a really nice long antenna back here so you can get some really good um, reception. And I like the crossfire antenna mount they have back here as well. So pretty nice. Uh, Quad Doc says, Straya. Uh, Spider Monkey says, what is the weight of the V3 versus the V4? The V4 is actually like three grams heavier. I want to say this was 228 grams and the V3 was 225. So, but I'll take it, you know. And I thought it was actually, the funny thing is, it seems physically slightly smaller. Um, it's like, it, it fits in the hand so small. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it was three grams heavier. So that's encouraging. Um, Mike said he was just kidding about the V4s. I was just looking to trigger a few guys. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. I was almost crying. Uh, <laughs> that's crazy. I was just looking at the Roma three. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't fly much analog, you know, and you gotta remember guys, Everything that's on this on the channel is, is essentially for sale, except for stuff that I race. Um, so if you ever need one of these and you're in the U.S., I'm not doing international shipping right now. It's just too difficult. But if you ever need one of these, um, most of these things are are in like like new shape, like this. They got all the box and everything. So if you got one up and you see it on the channel, just let me know. Ask me if I got it. 
uh, you might be able to pick it up for me. I'm usually too lazy to go listing them for sale. Um, if the channel gets bigger, maybe I'll be able to just give them all away like uh, like a lot of the bigger guys do. But at this point, like I got to fund most of the stuff that I build. I do get sent a few buying the flies here and there, but most of the stuff I'm I'm building is the good stuff. The people that do only bind and flies, it's like the eh, it's all right. But if you want to fly the armor tan, the callus machine works, the apex, nobody's sending those out, right? You gotta buy it. And so uh, you know, of course, like all the builds, most of the builds on the channel are like four or five hundred bucks. So unfortunately, I gotta sell this stuff. But if you want one of those, just hit me up. I got one. Uh yeah, uh spider monkey, yes, that is the analog version of the Roma L3. Um, maybe the V3 DJI will have OLED. Yeah, I hope so. What are you guys, what are the lifespan you're getting out of 6S? Uh, it's hard to say, uh, quad doc about the longevity of battery packs on 6S because we usually kill them racing, crashing into stuff. If I was only freestyling and I was not discharging them lower than like three and a half volts per cell, they last a pretty long time. I mean, I have several packs that are over a year old and, you know, I fly, you know, at least once a week, um, right? So there's there's probably quite a few packs that have 100 cycles on them that are still going. Um, but the, the reality is a lot of them will die much quicker than that because I smack them on a gate, especially when I go racing at the night spot at least a couple times a month. Uh, Evan says what is the best bind and fly for sub 350 hd quad and my if you're talking about a five inch i'm saying i'm going with the diatone roma hd uh yeah it's about 320 bucks or so like i mean you know, add crossfire you might be right at 350 but that is a hell of a quad you can't build an hd quad for anywhere close to that price the armor tan builds that i build um the callus machine works the apex all of those builds are up closer to 500 dollars, and that roma really flies really close yeah there's a few things that are not going to be quite there but like the way that it flies the performance you're really not sacrificing hardly anything if anything you're sacrificing maybe a little bit of durability on the frame but you save 150 dollars when you bought it so even if the frame starts to go, you can buy a hundred dollar frame and you're still cheaper by 50 bucks. So I would have to say that. If you're talking about smaller than that, uh, I like that Emacs three and a half inch they just came out with. Um, got one on the way. Um, so I'm I have high hopes about that. Uh, let's see what else is back there. Uh, if not, like the Flywheel Explorer is a really like fun, fun quad that's also right around 300 bucks. So, you know, for sure. Evan, man, thanks a lot for that uh, $5 super chat. Um, I really appreciate that. And of course, thank you a lot. Oh, you know what? I didn't know I could click on comments and it would show up there. So, yeah, thanks, man. Uh, anytime, always happy to answer you guys' questions at the end of this. The, of the stream um tremco says no one within 300 miles of me flies fpv no one i can't even find a spotter where do you live man do you live on mars because even there they got people flying fpv have you seen the ingenuity copter so i don't know if that's true is it true oh it says he lives in alaska okay well Actually, there's a YouTuber guy I know, Steven something or other. I'll see if I can find his name. He lives in Alaska, I think, and he's starting to fly FPV. Oh, no, wait. It's not Alaska. It's Ireland. I mean, they're almost the same, right? Okay, sorry. Never mind. I'm going crazy. Uh, Smalls, thanks a lot. Thank you, brother. Thanks for coming to... Uh, participating in the chat mike bergman says has anyone cracked a dji fpv v1 radio open i i had it for a while uh i used it a few times i did not crack it over i i mean it works great it charges easy like what i don't why would you want to crack it open um danger dave is here 
Um, Nitro Nut says naked Vista for racing. I'm going to say no. I'm going to say no. Um, one of the best things about the DJI system for racing is how indestructible it is. Uh, I've been racing for a long time. And I've been flying almost the same Vista for since I started, since I built my first DJI race quad. So I've flown um, DJI race quad with a Vista so many times. I've crashed so many things. I broke so many things. But the Vista just won't die. It's like virtually unkillable. And I would recommend um, for racing, you're going to want to leave those heat sinks on because a lot of times on racing, you'll go up to the line, you'll put your quad down, you'll be waiting for a few minutes, and you don't, you know, like in those instances, sometimes you got to wait for everybody to be ready. So your quad could be on the line for two, three, four, sometimes five minutes. And when those BTXs all start to cook, uh, you don't want to have a naked beast in that instance. That's why I think naked beasts are really good like in micros where you're probably going to be ripping around like in a yard or a park where you're going to be flying alone. So as soon as you turn it on, you can arm it, go fly. You're not going to have to worry about that too much. Uh, but as far as like racing, nah, it's not worth saving like the 10 or 12 grams in my opinion. Oscar says he's stuck on the Roma L3 or the GEP RC Phantom. I'm still new and would be my second drone. Uh, I kind of like the Diatone stuff. The Diatone is a year newer. Um, and so generally, if you're looking at two things, look at when they came out. A year in FPV is a, is a decent amount of development and advancement. So if you are considering specs-wise, they're close. Uh, I would take the diatone probably in that case. Unless I'm mistaken. If they're the same age, then, you know, buy whichever one's on sale for cheaper. Quad Doc says, Armitan frames are so good. I smacked one into a tree this week, bent and stripped two of the M2 bolts, and the carbon was unscratched. Yeah, those things are unkillable, man. Uh, I got my space grade. You can actually see it right there. I got my space grade Marmont back there. I had to strip it down for another project, but I'm going to be building it back up for this season. So stay tuned for that. Uh, all right, we got to wrap this up. I'm going to read the rest of the comments. And when I get to the end, we're closing it out. <laughs> uh, no crap. Go Google Slanka, Alaska. It redefines remotes. Yeah, well, I mean, okay, so maybe it'd be hard, you know, is there like Eskimos up there? Maybe they can, you know, or if not, maybe some polar bears uh, can get them to fly with you. Or you, you do like some Cinewoo polar bear chasing, that would be dope. Uh, or maybe like a, a moose, they got moose up there, caribou, I don't know. Mike Bourbon, want to put a different switch in the corner because I hate having my arm switch on a normal flip switch. I like the press button like on the Tango 2. Yeah, I do. I, I agree with you there. I do like the press button on the Tango 2. I ended up flying the Jumper T18 a little bit more, but, uh, you know, that's what I did. Okay. Tortastic says he's looking to build something for cinematic flying. What's the best frame with a five and a half inch to six inch with no props in the GoPro view? Uh, I really like the six inch Banggood. I like the six inch Badger by Armitan. Um, those are probably my two six inch favorite um, cinematic ones. Do they make a six inch Apex? Because the Apex is also very, very good. You could also go with like a six inch Glide. I think I kind of like the uh, Banggod and the Badger better. So I would go with either one of those probably. Um, Trinko says, I'm an Eliwood native. That's awesome, man. And you got into FPV. Um, I, so do you, I'm guessing you do some long range out there. That's really cool. I can't imagine, you know, when it gets cold here, like I'm already complaining, I can't imagine how cold it gets up there. New question, will overheating the VTX kill it? Yes, you can. Um, not usually while you're flying because you have so much of that air re recirculating, but that's why you should not have a VTX powered up on the bench for like more than, you know, a few minutes at a time. If you're working on something, um, leave it on for three, five minutes, and then unplug it, give it a rest, let it cool down for a few minutes before you keep going. Don't 
um, leave a VTX powered up on the bench or outside or anywhere for like longer than 5, 10, 20, you know, because once you get longer, yeah, it can just overeat. Ben T's got family out there in Alaska. Yes, Ben T out there in Austin, Texas. Dog is dog. He says the Roma F5 works, but it doesn't come installed. You need to install it yourself. Yeah. Oh, the receiver. Yeah. Um, Trimco says I have seven quads, three to ten inch. Building a beast class now. Yeah. Oh man. Uh, if you do that, I'd love to see some footage, uh, Trimco. So we'll all have to go check out your uh, channel in a little bit. We'll see if we can catch that beast class cruising the Alaskan plains or the mountains i guess it depends on which part uh, okay we're gonna close it out there um so thanks everybody for joining the chat got up to uh, almost 50 people today so a good one uh this was a fun topic uh so my encouragement is if in the next three months you can find yourself out to meet up with some freestylers or some racers Come back to one of my videos. Leave me a comment. Tell me how it went. Tell me what you think. And tell me if you do it again. Thanks, guys, for coming to the show. Uh, the, the show where John is always right. And if you agree with him, you could be right, too. Thanks, guys.